Hey, I'm Pusher, and today we're doing a song breakdown for the first time in a few years, actually. We're going to be looking at the song Postman from the new Toru Moi album, Mahal. Here's the general table of contents for what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to handle all the global information so you know kind of the general idea of the song. And there'll be audio examples as we go along as well. And then we take closer looks at the instrumentation, the form, the chords, the melody. And then at the end of the video, I sum everything up in the takeaways section. Before we get into all of that, though, I wanted to talk about why I chose to do this song specifically. A lot has changed in music in the last few years. Years, and a lot of the music that I found myself listening to has been like Unknown Mortal Orchestra and like Toru y Moi and like Krungbin and stuff that's a little more sort of chill and vibey, maybe psychedelic, sort of Tame Impala vibes. So when this album first came out like a month ago, I was very excited to see that the first song is an Unknown Mortal Orchestra feature. And after being a big fan of the last few Toru y Moi albums, it was interesting to me that this one takes a really psychedelic rock direction. Uh, right off the top, it reminds me of things like Pink Floyd's Animals and like Super Tramp and uh, Jimi Hendrix even. And I would say that that's kind of the overall vibe of the album, but this one particular song, Postman, is an outlier from that. It's more of a funky thing, it's very repetitive, it's loop-based. It seems incredibly simple on the surface, but just generally, I found it to be sort of like a, a lightning rod for my attention on the album. It was the first song that I gravitated to on the album, and that's kind of why I wanted to take a closer look at it, to see why this simple song and this album of otherwise uh, very sort of dense and interesting psychedelic rock is the one to catch my attention. And I do think that the overall theme of this particular song, Break down is going to be a lesson in keeping things simple, which is also something that I don't really gravitate to towards in my own writing, so I'm interested in looking at and seeing how to uh, make the most of very few elements in a song. All right, so let's dive into this lesson in how to keep a very simple song interesting for two and a half minutes. Let's start with the global information. The BPM is 112, so we're sort of looking at a slow house music vibe, and it is very much a four on the floor, kick, snare, kick, snare kind of pattern through the song. We're in the key of E minor, there's nothing terribly interesting about that. The time signature is 4-4, four, four. nothing terribly interesting about that. The length is 2 minutes and 40 seconds, so it's a little bit shorter than your average pop song, which usually clocks in at 3 and a half minutes. And it's about 65 bars long, plus a longer intro and a short little outro makes it about 75 bars in total. And the intro and the outro are sort of like skits, where the intro is going to the post office to say, Hello, do you have any mail for me today? No? Okay, thank you. See you tomorrow then. Hello, Mr. Postman. Did I get any mail today? No? Okay. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow then. So it's like a skit. And then the outro is a very short bit of car noise. And you can see on the album cover he's got a jeepney, which in the Philippines is the regular form of public transit. And so similar to an album like USA by Sirkin, this is almost sort of a concept album where the car noise is threaded through the skits and radio dial interference is sort of one of the, the recurring sounds on the album, like between songs. And so it feels almost like a concept album of a road trip. And one thing I've noticed from doing a bunch of these breakdowns, some of which I've turned into videos and some of which I haven't, is that a lot of songs benefit an awful lot from having just a little bit of whatever noise at the beginning and the end of the song, just to sort of buffer it from the silence of the world. Mr. Postman. Now let's look at the instrumentation and arrangement of the song. So again, this is a very, very simple song. It's very stripped down. There's not too much going on in it. We've got vocals, we've got bass, we've got drums, we've got a little bit of piano in the bridge. And then if you want to talk about the skits, we've got what I'd consider effects at the beginning and the end of the song. If we take a quick look at the arrangement spreadsheet that I put together, you can see that the bass and the drums are kind of the most ever present thing especially the bass, and that's true when you listen to the song. The bass is very much the main melody, and the vocals are more of like an accent every other bar. Mr. Postman, did I get mail? Did I get a letter? Did I get a postcard? And the bass is actually just a looping bit of audio, and I know that because I've compared the same bar in each eight bar loop of the bass, and they are identical. So in this situation where the vocal's not really leading the melody and the bass is just looping, the way that it's kept interesting, and you can see this reflected in the spreadsheet, is with the constantly changing drums. Elements are constantly coming in and going out, and there are different variations and like different open hi-hats, and there's a 16th note tambourine, there's a 16th note hi-hat, there's an 8th note hi-hat. The kick and snare are pretty regular, and while generally the kick and snare are doing a backbeat four on the floor pattern, there are occasional variations on that. If you look at the MIDI of the drums, you can see that things are kind of coming in and going out in a way that's not really the most regular. Just another bill to pay. 
And so there's this interesting thing where even though the bass is kind of the main melody, the thing that's doing the real work to keep the track interesting is the drum. If we look closer at the drums too, we have sort of a looser feel. So nothing is perfectly quantized here, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was played by a real drummer, but of course, you know, it could be done with MIDI as well if someone were, you know, careful and dragging things around. When you look really closely at the audio, you can see the hi-hats and the tambourine don't land on the beat, they land slightly behind. I've watched a number of videos on the Dilla feel to try to figure out what was going on here, and I know that some people like to divide their hi-hats into uh, like groups of seven and have like a little four and a little three, and I know that some people like to just, just take all of their hi-hats and drag them all the same amount behind the beat, but I don't think that's what's happening here, because if we look at some hi-hats and some tambourine bits, they seem to be a certain amount behind the beat, and then other ones right next to them will be a little bit closer to the beat or a little bit further from the beat, and so it seems like it may have just been played live and it's loose, or maybe it's quantized but not to 100%, but yeah. So all the hi-hats tend to be a little bit behind the beat, and that keeps this thing kind of moving and feeling a little more human, and it keeps things feeling pretty fresh too, especially with that bass that is actually just looping verbatim uh, for the entire song, pretty much. Mr. Postman. Another recurring theme in this song that we'll probably start to notice in all of these instruments and the way that they're performed is that what this song is going for is this effortless kind of chill. And we've seen this before in one of the breakdowns where we talked about finesse the Bruno Mars and Cardi B remix. Normally in the chorus of a song, we would increase intensity and the vocal range would go up, but in the finesse remix, the vocal range actually lowers and the intensity of the track lowers and it gives you kind of this effortless cool, right? That's right. And that effortless kind of cool is sort of the overall vibe of this particular song. It's very much like, hey, got any mail from me? No? Okay, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow then. And the whole song kind of has that like very chill, very vibey, and so the drums being a little bit behind the beat, that contributes to it. And we'll talk about this more in the melody, but the vocal range actually usually stays in a conversational area. He's not usually going very high and low, he's not doing vocal gymnastics. It's very much like Mr. Postman. Mr. Postman. Right? It's chill. It's super chill. I have two more notes for instrumentation. The first one is the bass. Because the bass is looping, uh, an interesting thing that's happened here to keep it from getting stale is there's a sort of wah effect on it, uh, sort of opening and closing automatically of a filter. <laughs> but it sort of adds a little bit of nuance and a little bit of depth to the sound of the bass, which because it's repeating all the time, um, it would be very easy for that to get stale and repetitive. Stale and repetitive. Stale and repetitive. I'll bring that up later as a lesson. And I mentioned that there's piano in this song. It's vocal, bass, drums, and piano, but the piano only happens for about three bars at the end of the bridge. It's not really contributing to the song overall. It just adds a little bit of hectic, uh, sort of atonal chaos at the end of the bridge. She forgot to put it in box what the fox instrumentation simple right let's move on to the form of the song so like many songs we have an intro and an outro slapped onto the song and then there are two ways of conceiving of the form of this song. You can see these both in the form spreadsheet under the sections at the top. I've named these sections based on how they sort of feel relative to a regular song. Uh, so we have chorus, post-chorus, verse, we've got a bridge, and then at the end we've got a vibe. It's really not a vibe. And this particular way of looking at the song is one that follows the melody primarily. So the choruses will be the same, the verses will be the same, the post-choruses will be the same. But that doesn't really tell the full story. So if we look at the second line of sections, what we see is that it's just loop, 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 and then there's a bridge and then loop, loop. And that's a way of looking at this song that reflects what the track is doing. Because as I said, the bass is just looping throughout the entire song and the drums are kind of coming in and out to um, keep things fresh. We could very much look at it as the same bunch of looping sections and then a bridge and then the loop again at the end. And so depending whether you're looking at the vocal melody and how that changes or you're looking at the track, you could look at this in two different ways. Now there's a lesson here though. When I first got into songwriting, I realized quickly that the average song form has three sections and it usually goes verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. 
right? And that way you get the repetition of choruses. But I started to realize that that wasn't a necessary formula for songwriting, and that the more important question to be asking yourself at any moment in a songwriting process is, what's the most interesting thing that could happen next? And so if we take sort of a holistic view of looking at this, the form of this song, we can see that we've just basically got looping bass. He figured out a bass line that sounded good. And he's got drums that kind of come in and out to keep things interesting, uh, either adding intensity or taking away intensity to create contrast between the different eight bar sections. And then he's kind of mixing and matching that with different sections of the vocal. So if you were to try to write a song like this, you could conceive of it like, oh, I've got a bass loop that I really like. Let's add some drums to this and just see what variations on the drums sound good to me. And then you can kind of mix and match those. Then you could say to yourself, well, let's try writing a bunch of different vocal melodies. What sounds good? And then you could start to mix and match those with the drums. And you can see that the drums never actually really repeat themselves in earnest. Every section is slightly different. It's got a slightly different variation of what's happening in the, the percussive hi-hat tambourine elements. And the vocal's sort of contributing to that. You very much do not have uh, like symmetrical sections. You just have like there's a chorus, a post-chorus, a verse, a post-chorus, a chorus, a bridge, and then there's no vocals for the vibe section, and then uh, you have a post-chorus again at the end. So it's very much not this formulaic way of approaching songwriting. It's just sort of like, what can we do next that contributes to the vibe most? How can we like subtly shift the energy of the song? And I think that that's an important lesson. You don't have to be stuck to uh, like a dogmatic three-part form, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. You can just say, what could happen next? What would be an interesting thing to have happen next in the song? And I think that it's interesting to see how we accomplish that. There's one more thing I want to talk about with form, and it's the bridge. This song is a tremendously elegant and simple example of uh, how to create contrast in the bridge from the rest of the song by subtly shifting the focus of things. So right away, the most obvious thing is that the drums drop out, and the vocal is now a solid pink line instead of every so often. What's really happening under the hood here, though, is that the bass goes from the main melody to a supporting part, and the vocal goes from a supporting melody to the main part. And when we're talking about contrast in song sections, what we're really talking about is how to shift a person's focus from one place to another. And I think that that's incredibly simple. There's only three things going on in the song. The bass is the main melody, the vocal's supporting, and the drums are always there. So what happens? The drums are not there, the bass becomes the supporting element, and the vocal becomes the main melody. Simple, simple, effective, sounds great, and then it creates enough contrast that when we go back into the looping section for the last two eight bar sections, well, we're glad to be back. She forgot to put it in the mailbox. What the fox? It feels like a return to where we came from, and the song even though it's just looping pretty much, never feel stale because of what happens in all these instrument parts. Let's talk about the chords. The chords in this song, remember the bass is just looping, the chords are just sort of like an E minor to an A7, so a one minor and a four seven. Simple, not really anything else going on there. The bass line is simple, it mostly focuses on the roots and then it has this little tritone motion. This tritone interval, which is three whole tones, has a very distinctive sort of flavor. Uh, it's really good for funk, it's really good for blues, it's really good for like soul and R&B stuff. Postman, did I get mail? Did I get a letter? Uh, it's got a very distinctive kind of... Um, dissonance to it. And so it's mostly just the roots and this tritone thing. Now the tritone thing stays the same all the time and the roots change from E to A. And then the bridge, he's pretty much just walking up and down between the roots of the chords. Not too much to it. One thing I will say about the E minor to A7 repeating chord through the entire song is that it makes this song feel sort of uncomplicated makes it feel kind of easy, makes it feel very familiar, right, when you get into it. And that contributes to this overall feeling of chill. Now let's look at the melody. We talked about the bass melody and harmony, so let's focus on the vocal melody. All the notes in the vocal melody are in the E minor blues scale. Makes sense along with the sort of blues and funk bass tritone bass line, right? I mentioned this before, the vocal melody has an extremely limited range. It mostly just hangs around the tonic E. Sometimes we use a minor third, sometimes we use a major third, and that presents just enough color change to keep the song kind of feeling interesting, 
But again, like the Bruno Mars finesse chorus, uh, the vocal range being kind of low, almost like a conversational thing rather than more of a, a performing of singing thing, makes this song feel very, very chill. Apart from his actual vocal performance where he's doing lyrics and stuff, there are the post choruses where he does like vocal fry screams and yelps and stuff. <laughs> And it's actually the same four screams that have basically just been copy and pasted. There are three post choruses. In the first two, he's got what I call the crazy train echo on it. I, 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 and in the last post chorus, there is no echo on it, it's just dry. The echo to me is just a way of sort of filling up space and keeping things moving. And at the end of the song, keeping things dry kind of gives us the feeling of winding the thing down. <laughs> There's another really interesting, very subtle thing he does with his vocal performance, which contributes to a feeling of chill. Now, I had mentioned his very sort of dry, cool, very um, not singy, almost conversational singing style, right? With the limited range, like he's talking. And if we look at the length of his notes, you can see that a lot of them are very short, which is normal for talking, right? If you're talking and you hold a note, if you just hang on to it, it's gonna feel more like singing. So uh, in some cases, he'll make it very short like that, like it's conversational. And the words actually tend to cut off with snare hits, which keeps things feeling very tight. It makes the snares feel snappier. But then some of the time, he'll hold his words just a little bit longer so it's it feels a little more like singing but still not like a big you know elaborate vocal performance but it sort of gives a little bit of strut in his walk you know postman 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 it's not quite talking but it's not quite singing mr postman conversational mr postman a little more singy, but still not trying too hard, just very laid back, good vibes. Okay, so that's how the song works. Now let's talk about the takeaways. Let's talk about the songwriting lessons that we can take and apply to our own work for the rest of our lives. Because I imagine that's what we're all actually doing here. Takeaway one. First off, it's simple as hell. The kiss rule. Keep it simple, stupid, right? Frankly, I could stand to take that advice. If there are other jazz nerds here, I'm probably not the only person who feels guilty when I only use two chords. Another important lesson, obviously, is the intro and outro. Having noise there, having people talking, having literally anything, a wind-up sound, anything at the start and end of the song is going to add just a little bit of something so it doesn't just start happening. The wonky timing of the drums, not quite dillophile, not quite quantized, not quite perfect. Um, really helps keep things fresh, and also the little fills, the extra little kick hits, the extra little snare rolls, the extra little uh, hi-hat crescendos, the extra little percussive stuff, the coming in and going out of different sort of hi-hat and percussive elements really, really helps keep what would be an otherwise very repetitive song fresh. Relating to the vocal performance, we have eight different sections in the song, not including the intro and the outro. And in these eight sections, we have five different variations on vocal performances, choruses, post-choruses, verses, the vibe, and the bridge. That means more often than not, you are hearing a new vocal section. And that can be tremendously powerful to keep things fresh, even though it's very simple and he's not really saying too much. And what he's saying is mostly just post office stuff. It keeps it very interesting and fresh to always have something new happening. Here's the thing about the chords that I was forced to realize by this song. Two chords is not inherently boring. As they say in the industry, I heard this from Bad Snacks, if it's a vibe, let it ride. The bass line feels good. Feels good through the entire song. He found a way to make it sound good. He found a way to keep it fresh with the drums. He found a way to add filter to it so there's enough nuance that it doesn't get boring. If it's a vibe, let it ride. Another takeaway I mentioned earlier was the dry, uh, chill, conversational vocal delivery. If you're going for that effortless cool, limit your vocal range, keep some space between every line, vary up your vocal delivery. It's a little bit talky, a little bit singy, just like the finesse chorus. Keep things kind of low in a normal conversational range instead of like singing vocal gymnastics. And that's an excellent way to make your song feel more sort of conversational and chill and everyday rather than more of like a contrived song. The bridge in the song is a fantastic lesson in swapping the focus from one element to another to create some contrast without really overdoing things. I mentioned this a few times already, but just for posterity, asking yourself not what should happen next in a normal song, but what's the most interesting thing that could happen next, even if it breaks with all formulas. It's also a lesson in chaos being your friend. When the piano comes in in the bridge with the ride cymbal playing whole tone scale and just like basically chaos for a short period of time, it does create a mood that creates 
contrast from the rest of the song without overdoing it. Adding depth and nuance to your sounds. The vocal's very dry except for the uh, post-choruses where there's a little bit of crazy train on it. The drums are very simple and dry, uh, elements just come in and out, but the bass, which loops all of the time, how do we keep that interesting? And the answer is a filter trick, right? Something, maybe a flanger or a chorus or some kind of moving element that changes the tone of it over time is a really good way to keep just a simple loop really interesting and nuanced and add some depth to it. And the last lesson is, of course, Crazy Train. Taking a simple element and adding a bit of delay to it increases the size of the space. It changes dramatically the sound of the overall track just to have a little bit of effect on something rather than having it dry, as evidenced between the first two post choruses. <laughs> and the last post-chorus. Remember, if you can hear a difference, you can make a difference. Anyway, that's my comprehensive critical listening song breakdown to Postman by Toro y Moi from the album Mahal. If you enjoyed the thing and you want to see more of these, let me know. I've also finally added some ways that you can actually materially support my work uh, to my link tree. I've added a Patreon where you can support me at different tiers by giving me a couple dollars every month. I've added an Amazon book wish list where you can buy me a book if you want. And all those progressive political songs that I've been doing over the last year and a half, I finally put those all on Bandcamp. Uh, there's like 35 of them plus a couple little extra bonus bits and you get the videos as well. Um, and that's like $13 Canadian or something. So if if you'd like to support my work and send me a couple dollars for all of this, um, I'm not really able to monetize most of the work that I've ever done. So if you'd like to do that, I would appreciate that. And hopefully I can make these song breakdowns more of a regular thing because I learn a lot from them. Hopefully you learn a lot from them. Anyway, like, have a good one. I'll see you again soon, hopefully. Peace.